to my colleague Kim May, who will do the introduction of the Fillmore Group. Thank you, Frank. Um, we are presenting, we decided to do this presentation about a month ago. Uh, we had some discussions with a couple of our customers. We've been doing quite a bit of Q-replication work this year. And um, also, as a longtime IBM authorized training delivery partner, we had been back and forth with IBM and with uh, Aero ECS, who is our Global Skills Initiative global training partner, about trying to get a session, a Q-replication training class session scheduled. We have not run one for, I think, the past three years. Uh, we know several have been delivered privately, but there hasn't been any public education available. The Q-replication product is something we've worked with for many years, and it's something we know and love, and it's something that we want to continue to see customers be successful using. And that's why we decided to do this. So we've also, we've successfully, I believe at this point, gotten permission from IBM to add a public session of the CE243 using Q-replication class. And in addition, we um, Frank put together some notes on some of the new features and some of the functionality things that he's worked a lot with over the past year or so. And we're going to do, he's going to deliver them in this presentation. For those of you that aren't aware of who we are, the Fillmore Group is a premier IBM business partner. We've been around for about 25 years. Frank is a DB2 Gold consultant. We are a software, um, an IBM software reseller. If you are using Q-Replication and would like to buy some more Q-Replication or IIDR licenses, feel free to give us a call. Um, and we're also a services provider. We have a team of folks that do Q-Replication implementation work and support work. So um, we're available if we can help. Thank you very much, Kim. That's a, that's a great start. Um, so who we are and why we're here, um, there are a couple of uh, housekeeping items. Number one, given the number of attendees, uh, everyone is on mute right now. And uh, it, would, it will be difficult to engage into a 60- uh, or 70-way uh, conversation. So what I've done is I have um, established breakpoints in the presentation where I will take questions either um, primarily through the chat. So if you are familiar with the GoToWebinar interface, there is the ability to post a question. So I'll go to breakpoints and, and try to entertain questions there. I have a lot of material. I have some deeply technical material that I want to share with you in terms of some handouts. Um, so there may be a lot of questions. We may need to defer some of those questions until later in the presentation or even run over. Uh, that way, if people need to, to, to hear the overview, they can do that and then drop off at the end, and then we can go a little bit longer if there's still some questions that you may have. Uh, I'm going to go back one slide. Um, these slides, by the way, are going to be posted on the Fillmore Group's blog along with a recording of this presentation. So if you have some colleagues or you need to do some review after uh, the webinar, they will be av available on the Fillmore Group's blog in a day or so. So the, the topics that we plan to cover today are primarily a cold starting a Q replication topology, uh, the Oracle native Q-apply, uh, the ability to uh, replicate uh, directly to uh, an Oracle target uh, using Q-replication, an overview of the tools that are available and some, some pluses and minuses and some positioning for those tools so you know what tool to use in, in terms of building and administering your Q-replication environment, and um, the ASN consumer, uh, the ability to replicate to Natiza, which can also be expanded to other non-relational platforms like uh, Hadoop, and finally some pricing models and some changes. So with that, we're going to go ahead and talk about some of the technical aspects of what it is that um, we want to discuss today. So the first one is the uh, cold starting a Q replication topology. So when I, um, I'm going to start uh, by asking a question, and that is, um, have you ever needed to cold start a Q replication topology? I'm going to launch this poll. Um, again, using the GoToWebinar interface, you should see the uh, questions. Uh, if you could uh, go ahead and respond to that, we'll give a couple, folks a couple of minutes uh, to give their answers, and that'll help, um, uh, help me position uh, the, the type of discussion that we have coming up. But right now, we're looking at about two-thirds of the folks have had to cold start a Q replication topology before for one reason or another. And the others are afraid to answer. <laughs> <laughs> or, or maybe they needed to. They never, they've never had to, but they needed to and they, they didn't did. know. They so, did. yeah. So we'll talk about all those topics in just a second. 
So, okay, I, I think we have our, um, the bulk of the folks that are going to respond. Um, we see uh, almost 60% yes and 40% uh, no. So I'll be very curious uh, when you see the techniques that uh, I have recommended, whether this is the same sort of path that you have followed. So I'm going to go ahead and close the poll so you can uh, see the, um, the presentation again. We're looking at the uh, cold start AQ replication topology. Um, so the questions are, when and why would you need to consider a cold start and what are the steps? So the when and why. Um, everybody has done a cold start of a Q-replication topology that has used Q-rep because the first time you use it is by default a cold start. Uh, the cold start establishes your position in the log. Um, it uh, sets a, a point in the restart queue. Uh, in the log uh, for uh, queue capture so you can determine where you're at, where uh, data is to be loaded if you are um, loading tables uh, from the source database as well as where you start picking up transactions uh, that have been committed in the DB2 log. Um, the second reason that you might want to uh, do a cold start is if queue replication has been down for an extended period and you won't be able to catch up. So um, we worked several years ago with a, uh, a national law enforcement agency in the United States and uh, found that they had been down because they had not incorporated a lot of monitoring. Um, they did not realize until their users called them up and said, I know that these transactions have been issued in the primary database. This was a, uh, a high availability topology, DB2 for ZOS, replicating the DB2 for ZOS. And uh, they're not appearing on the secondary system, the, the failover system. Why is that? Replication had been down for two weeks, and they decided at that point that there would be no way that they could catch up um, for two weeks' worth of logs needed to do a cold start. Um, the next reason is that the source database logs are unavailable. Um, um, log retention, uh, queue capture reads from the logs, reads um, sequentially through the sets of logs. All the logs need to be there. One reason the log may not be there is related to the, the previous reason in that QREP has been do um, down for a while and the logs have been archived to a, uh, an offline storage medium uh, and, and may not be retrievable or um, through, you know, disk failure or some other reason, the, the DB2 uh, um, or Oracle, the, the two primary sources for queue replication, logs may be lost, and if they're not recoverable, you need to do a cold start. And then finally, um, the reason that I have seen um, um, most recently uh, is that a topology becomes uh, unstable. Uh, this usually happens in a non-prod environment where you're setting things up. Uh, you may be new to the product and learning about it. But I've had two customers within the last two months, one that had an, an, a series of crashes of the, um, of the QApply uh, product. And because QReplication uh, coordinates between databases, reading database logs, applying to database targets, um, and using Q replica, uh, Q, um, WebSphere MQ as the transport medium, um, the coordination of all those facilities needs to be pretty tight. QREP is pretty resilient, but there may be situations where if you have enough crashes or enough things go down, um, you get out of sync uh, between those components, and you need to uh, re-coordinate or, or, or re-establish a, a connection between all of them. So I had one customer had Q applied crash several times, had another customer a while ago, uh, was having trouble loading the data um, using the uh, the auto load feature. Uh, so um, this particular um, QREP specialist had started some subscriptions that were supposed to auto load. He didn't see the auto loads go off, so he started the subscriptions again. Didn't see the auto load, so started them again. And what was happening is that he wasn't looking in the right place. So he had two or three loads going at one time for the same subscriptions and, and just created a mess. So those are some examples of why you would um, need to... Um, uh, cold start a, um, a QREP topology. So caution. I put this in red um, because I, I'm now going to share with you some collateral that I have developed over a period of years. This is a template. The recommendation is that you use these tools judiciously, um, that you work with, if you are not yourself very experienced with QREP, you work with someone who is, either on your team or, or a consultant like the Fillmore Group, um, because if you are not familiar with the techniques that I'm about to show you and you use them indiscriminately, you may make a worse mess than you already have. 
So um, the first caution is the steps that are discussed might or might not be appropriate for your particular situation. And we're going to talk about updating some of the control tables and, and making some changes that are very specific um, that, that you need to understand the impact that, that, you're going to, that they're going to have on your environment. Um, you want to review each step with an experienced QREP colleague or consultant, as I mentioned before. And um, most definitely, you want to test these steps in a non-prod environment before you try to do them in production. So with that, I'm going to go at a high level over the next two slides on cold starting a Q-replication topology. Uh, and then I'm going to ask you to actually retrieve a handout. I'm using a new feature of GoToWebinar that I've never used before, but I've actually posted a PDF which goes into these steps in much greater detail. So the beginning steps are to bring down QCapture and QApply. Um, because you're going to be updating the uh, control tables on both sides, they should be down. Um, the second step is to clear out the WebSphere MQQs. So the send and receive queue all the transactions should be deleted. Uh, the admin queue, all of the transactions should be deleted. And again, I am, I am directing this presentation to intermediate and advanced level um, queue replication specialists. If you're not sure what an admin queue is, please don't attempt what I'm about to show you. Um, you're also going to need to delete any spill queues. Spill queues are spawned primarily when you are loading data uh, from a table at the source into the target. Uh, and QApply can uh, um, uh, insert, update, or delete the transactions that are coming down the pipe. Um, so these are diverted to uh, an MQ spill queue. These sp spill queues are disk files that are spawned by MQ. And then when the load is completed, these spill queues will be consumed by QApply, and then normal QREP processing will take over. However, in an unstable environment, you may have spill queues hanging out there um, um, that are unrelated to anything that's going on in your QREP environment, and they may cause problems downstream. The next step is to cancel any currently running table load utilities. This will depend on the database server that you're working on. If you're working on DB2 for ZOS as the source, uh, then you're going to issue a term utility uh, for the, the loads that are occurring, um, the DSN util. Uh, the, uh, if you are using the, um, uh, the, the uh, DB2 for LUW, you're going to need to kill whatever um, loads are occurring on that uh, target database server. So you're going to need to know where you're at, what operating system, what database server you're running on. This could even be SQL Loader if you're using uh, Oracle. So be aware uh, of what environment you're in, but identify any load utilities that may be in flight um, that uh, are running and, and cancel them so that they're not hanging out there uh, indefinitely. The next set of steps is to delete or rename the auto load trace files. I'm going to give you examples of what those trace files look like. These again are spawned on auto loads. Uh, they give you a, uh, a, a, an overview of what happened during a particular load for a particular subscription within QREP. Uh, this may be um, something that you would um, uh, review if uh, a load failed for some reason. These are usually spawned and then deleted automatically uh, by QREP. Uh, they would only be hanging out there if um, your uh, QApply crashed in the midst of uh, performing a load. I've included in my handouts a couple of scripts. Uh, I'm going to go over those scripts in a little bit of detail. Again, in the interest of time, um, my expectation is this will provide you with a roadmap or a hunting license to be able to, um, to, to, do the, to um, coordinate the steps necessary. Um, but I wanted to give you an example of something that I've used in the past. You may need to modify this or adapt this to your particular environment. Finally, after all of those cleanup st uh, steps are completed, you need to start uh, Q Capture cold and Q Apply. Um, and then if you have started Q Capture using this start mode, not the star mode, uh, there's a, a typo in the presentation, uh, you want to reset that uh, to warm SI. Understand when you start QREP, you may be picking up the start mode from either the um, Q, um, IBM QREP uh, underscore cap farms table or you may be picking that up from the DB2 for ZOS started task or from the, um, um, the script that you run the uh, ASN uh, uh, QCAP uh, program um, that can override what is in the IBM QREP underscore 
uh, cap harms table. So you need to know where the start mode is being set in order to change it first to cold. And then finally, um, once you have come up cold, you issue the cap start commands to actually start your, um, uh, your, your QREP environment. So with that, I'm going to go back. I went too far. I have a handout. If you look in your um, um, GoToWebinar uh, GUI interface, uh, there are a series of three handouts, all PDF files. If you could open the first one that is called uh, Q Replication Cold Start Procedure, and we will talk about that for a second. And that should open up in your browser, and you're going to see my version of that right now. So I'm going to give everybody a second to be able to pull that up. And I'm not going to cover each of these steps in detail. We don't have the time available. I'm going to hit some of the high points and some of the things that I referred to in the earlier part of the, of the dialogue. And also, while you're doing that, I see a couple of hands raised and I see a couple of questions. So I'm going to see if I can. Okay. Okay, and Frank is, is responding to one of the questions. Someone's having a technical problem with some sound. Um, just so everyone knows, I think he, he said it at the beginning, but I guess they probably didn't hear it if they don't have sound. Um, we are recording this session, and it will be posted on our blog um, probably in the next day or two. So one of the things that happens if you can't hear it live, um, you can certainly go back and listen to the audio uh, recording. Cool, thank you. So at this point, I'm going to assume everybody has had the opportunity to open uh, the handouts, uh, that certainly the ones that want to. So this is the Q replication cold start procedure. Again, embedded in here is the warning. Um, cold start scenarios vary. Uh, it's important to understand how this procedure will be, need to be modified to accommodate your particular situation. So it goes through in greater detail uh, the, uh, the items that I just discussed before. A couple of things that I wanted to point out. Number one, when I mentioned the auto load trace file data sets, um, there's actually a link in this, uh, in this PDF uh, that shows you where the ZOS QApply load trace files uh, would be located uh, and the naming convention. Um, these will be in the apply path specified in the IBM QREP apply PARMS um, uh, directory that is specified. If apply path is not populated, they're in the directory where the QApply uh, log is found. Um, the LUW trace files have a different naming convention, but you can find them both right there. I talk about uh, in step six, uh, running the Q replication uh, control table cleanup scripts. And uh, especially the state and the has load phase um, 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 parameters uh, that, that need to be set and why they would be set. We'll see the scripts in a second. Uh, they're a little bit further down. Also, um, updating the start mode parameter, uh, both um, when you want to come up cold and then resetting that back to warm SI after you're completed. Uh, the cleanup apply.sql um, um, script uh, for the apply side. These are run on the capture server and the apply server respectively. Also discussing the correct settings for the state and the has load phase. And so finally, the scripts themselves. So uh, you can see as I'm scrolling down on my screen, you can also see this if you scroll down in your PDF, um, basically deleting from a lot of the monitor tables, the CAPMON, CAPQMON, CAPTRACE, and SIGNAL table, and then updating the SUBS table. Uh, and so this, again, is one a uh, particular way you may be updating your uh, subscriptions, you need to understand the state and the has load phase and the impacts that uh, those changes are. Uh, I, under I do an update of the send queues. This is all the send queues for a particular topology will be sent uh, to active. And then on the apply side, uh, again, a series of deletes. Um, and uh, again, mostly from the uh, monitoring tables, but also from things like the exceptions table, the done message table. The done message table is used to 
uh, clean up uh, items that are in the queue because queue apply does a non-destructive read of the queue, uh, reads a transaction but leaves it in the queue until a commit is made into the target database and then with an entry in the done message table goes back and cleans that up. Uh, so we want to make sure that those are all cleaned out and then again the update of the targets table equivalent to the subs table on the capture side uh, with the state and the has load phase. The one item that I would highlight here um, that I, I want to point out is the save RI table. Um, when I do an auto load, QApply automatically drops any referential integrity from the uh, target table so that the loads can be completed and, and won't fail uh, due to referential integrity constraints violations. Um, you know, a, um, a child key or a, a foreign key value not found in a parent table or, or a primary key. The one caution here is that if your queue apply failed while a load was in flight, and I had mentioned that earlier with the trace files and the utilities, that it may be important to retrieve the referential integrity from the save RI table before you delete it because otherwise the referential integrity won't be on the tables where you expect them. You could rebuild this through um, DDL if you have that for the, the target tables or you could rebuild this by extracting the referential integrity from the Save RI table. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to take a breath. I'm going to hand the microphone to Kim because she has something to say. And I'm going to look for questions in the chat. I think that would be the most effective way that you could post questions to me now. If you've had a chance to look at this, listen to the audio. Um, and if there's anything specific, Again, we won't be able to drill down into this too deeply because I've already used about a third of my time on this one section of the presentation. So Frank, obviously it's a good idea for any organization that's using queue replication to keep documentation like this available and to certainly customize it for their environment. Would you recommend to customers that are dependent on their queue replication that they research, that they do a cold start periodically? No, no, I don't think that's necessary. Um, it would be like uh, having an automobile and replacing the engine every 50,000 miles. If your engine is running and you have done, um, you know, periodic maintenance and you're monitoring, um, then yes, your environment should be stable. QREP, by, uh, and, and, and thank you for asking this question, this is an exceptional procedure. This is not something that you should have to do on a regular basis. A, a well-performing Q replication environment um, that has been well-maintained, you, you may never have to do that. Um, but it's only in the exceptional circumstances that I went over earlier that you would want to consider doing that. So if somebody has these instructions and they want to make sure their documentation is kept up to date, they can basically go through these, review them, see if there's anything that doesn't apply to them, and then make sure they keep them in a safe place. Right. I, I, I mean, the, the collateral that you see here has been collected by me over a period of years. Uh, and refined over a period of years working with a number of different customers. I mean, some of this stuff dates back to 2006, literally. I was doing some work in Qatar in the, the Persian Gulf for the uh, Ministry of the Interior um, during the, um, the, the, the run-up to the Asia Games. They, yeah. they wanted to have a high availability environment, DB2 for ZOS to ZOS uh, for their uh, um, customs and immigration systems. And that was the first time I had to do a cold start, as a matter of fact, so 10 years ago. And some of these techniques have been, have been refined since then. So the idea is, yeah, gather this stuff, file it away, have it available, and then if the time comes, you'll have it to refer to. Uh, by the way, and, and this is a very um, uh, important uh, point, is that I am not going to post the scripts that, that are in the handouts. I'm going to post the um, PowerPoint presentation on our blog and the audio on the blog, but I am just very worried about somebody getting a hold of these scripts who haven't heard the preparatory yes. lecture, and, and I would just be afraid that people w with, without enough um, um, perspective or, or context right. might, might misuse them. So, yeah. so the idea will not be there. So I have two questions that I'm going to answer and then we're going to move on to the next section. Um, one is, can you please let me know why um, referential integrity keys are dropped in the target database? So the reason is, if I am doing uh, a cold start especially and doing a massive number of loads of tables, I may have dozens or hundreds, um, in order to load those tables, uh, I want to drop the referential integrity constraints. There are two reasons for that. Number one is, 
having referential integrity constraints on a table when I load it will slow it down. And number two, there might be errors because if tables load at different rates or in different sequences, I may be loading a child table in a referential integrity um, uh, link um, where um, the foreign key uh, has a value inserted for a particular column where that value is not found in the primary key of the parent table. And so that would fail. So to avoid those failures, um, the, um, the Q apply drops uh, the, the referential integrity. And then once the load is completed, it reestablishes the referential integrity. So you don't, if QREP is working as designed, you don't have to do anything. The only reason that I mentioned the save RI table is if the, um, if the topology uh, should go down in the middle of a load and there may be a referential integrity create a, a primary key, create foreign key um, statements, as the, the actual SQL statements in the save RI table and, and the table doesn't have them anymore because it got dropped. You need to reapply that. So that was the reason that I mentioned that. And then the next question that came in, is this documentation uh, to be shared with attendees? So the handouts are yours. You should be able to open this in your browser. Your browser should allow you to actually download this as a PDF to save it. So this is the only place that this is going to be available. So grab it now. Uh, put, put, it, put it in your basket and, and put it in your cart and go to the checkout window. Um, and then the, um, the PowerPoint slides are going to be posted to our blog in the next day or so along with the recording. So no other questions. I'm going to roll on for now. I'm not sure how I got there. Okay. Okay, so our second topic is the Oracle Native QApply. Um, so before we even get started with this, I am going to issue another poll. Our second poll is, do you currently use the federated QApply for an Oracle database target? So let me give you a little bit of understanding of what federated apply is. QReplication scrapes from either DB2 or Oracle logs, places transactions on an MQ, uh, WebSphere MQ messaging system. These uh, transactions are retrieved from a QApply program and then inserts, updates, and deletes are applied against a target database. The ones that are natively supported are Oracle and DB2. Um, the Oracle support has just arrived within the past couple of years. It used to be that the only place that you could do an insert, update, or delete natively with QApply was either DB2 for LUW or DB2 for ZOS. So um, the, the, the workaround for that, if you wanted to insert, update, or delete against a SQL Server database or an Oracle database, is to use something called the federated server. And we'll talk about the federated server in a second. If you don't know what a federated server is, you're probably not using it. So I'm going to go ahead and launch this poll. And we will see the number of people who are using the federated server specifically for QApply. And we're seeing here something about um, a quarter, uh, about 25%. <coughs> And we'll give everybody a second to be able to respond. <laughs> so um, it looks like I'm going to go ahead and close that poll. About 22% said yes. So substantial number of people, uh, about um, 20 of the uh, attendees, uh, or at least tw uh, 20 of the uh, respondents. So um, the Oracle native QApply, I want to frame this so that everybody uh, understands what I'm recommending and what IBM recommends, which are two different things uh, as it happens. So IBM's recommendation uh, is that you if you are doing um, what they call homogeneous replication, any DB2 supported source to any DB2 supported target, use Q replication. 
That's the IBM playbook. If you are doing what they call heterogeneous replication, replicating from um, uh, any, any supported source uh, to any other supported source, and at least one of those is not DB2, use uh, change data capture. Change data capture is part of the IBM InfoSphere data replication packaging. You get the software that you need to do that. Um, and the only challenge with that recommendation is, and I, I look primarily to my DB2 for ZOS colleagues, is if I have Q capture running today, using Q replication on DB2 for ZOS, and I'm replicating, let's say, to another DB2 for ZOS for a high availability topology to another data center. And then some folks come along and say, well, gee, we'd like to get these transaction tables down into our enterprise data warehouse, which is on Oracle. Okay, DB2 for ZOS Oracle uh, replication. The IBM playbook says use the change data capture, which was originally IBM's um, 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 purchase of Data Mirror, the Data Mirror um, um, transformation server product that they bought seven or eight or, or nine years ago now. The only problem with that is now you have to place a second capture reading the same DB2 logs on your mainframe. Most cases people are trying to uh, reduce mainframe consumption. They're not looking to spin up CPU cycles by adding a second capture. IBM at one point had actually uh, tried to create a single capture that would replicate both Q replication and CDC. That project has been shelved. There is no uh, a single capture, if you know the code name Pegasus. IBM discussed it for a couple of years at the Insight Conference. That I, we attended some hands-on workshops using it. Um, but the bottom line is that's not an option. So here is a particular case. Um, there are other examples of um, CDC uses a completely different set of monitoring tools, of configuration tools. They have something called the Management Console. These are all very fine tools. I've used CDC for a while, but if you already have skills and the infrastructure in place for queue replication, ladling on a completely different product to solve this particular problem, i.e., I need to get data into Oracle, doesn't necessarily make sense for you. So, with all that, I'm going to explain how um, um, Oracle Native Queue Apply works. Go ahead, Kim. Yeah, I think one of the things I'd, I'd like to add to that is that the bottom line here is, is a simplicity versus complexity issue in terms of support. We see customers trying to support both CDC and queue replication in the same environments or within the same data center, and it's just extremely difficult, and you end up with two separate teams. So if there's any possible way to keep everyone doing the same, using the same technology, it really simplifies your administration. Thanks, Kim. So this is, a, this is taken directly from the IBM documentation that shows a federated environment. That this is the, the first environment we're going to talk about. So you can see the QApply uh, program here in the middle large rectangle, the QApply <clears throat> program, that is, uh, first of all, reading from the uh, MQQs, that is um, uh, conversing with QApply control tables, both in the target server, the middle um, um, rectangle, as well as the non-DB2 server over here on the right. Notice that there are QApply tables over here. Um, the QApply control table nicknames are a layer of indirection applied by um, the federated server that allows the QApply program to write to what it thinks is um, a DB2 database, but is actually going to Oracle SQL Server or something else. Um, there are also target nicknames um, that you can see in the bottom of the large middle rectangle. Um, the target table nicknames are another layer of indirection that the QApply program is writing to. These are the actual application tables that, um, where the data is being um, 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 loaded or, or uh, insert, updated, deleted into the target tables, again, Oracle, SQL Server, etc. Um, all those layer, uh, layers of indirection come at a cost. So what happens with uh, the native QApply as opposed to the federated server is that the apply control table nicknames, the QApply control tables that are local to the QApply program, and the target table uh, nicknames all go away. They are not needed. 
As a matter of fact, in order to use the federated server, you need to have a local DB2 database. That local DB2 database contains the metadata for the federated server, like the wrappers, like the servers, like the nicknames. All of that needs to be maintained and backed up. All of that complexity, as Kim pointed out, goes away because the QApply program here on the target server will be able to write directly to Oracle uh, control tables, which are located only in the Oracle uh, target database, and the target application tables themselves, your, your audit tables, your finance tables, your logistics tables, your personnel tables, whatever, whatever it is that you want to replicate. All of that goes there directly. Again, this only works for Oracle targets. That includes Rack, Exadata, and Vanilla Oracle. Um, I have the Oracle, uh, the, the QApply program uh, in this second target server. You can actually co-locate QApply on the server that contains the Oracle database itself, and that would actually be the recommendation. Um, the only reason that I left it separate here is that QApply is not certified for the version of Linux that runs on Exadata. So you are required to have an intermediate server to run QApply and have customers that are doing that now. However, if you are installing Oracle on your servers, you have a supported uh, version of Linux or Windows, for that matter, whatever operating system you want to run your Oracle on, you could co-locate QApply and the Q Manager, the WebSphere MQ Q Manager, on the same server and eliminate the additional network hop. So a lot of verbiage, I'm going to turn it over yeah. to Kim. Um, and one question for you, Frank. I'm assuming with this that the replication is unidirectional. You can only, you're only replicating from, from Z to Oracle, not back, right? Okay, so the, the, the question is, are you able to do this by direction? And the answer would be yes, you could if you wanted to. As a matter of fact, we've had customers that ask about that. Oracle is supported as a source for Q replication as well as a target. So we've had some customers say specifically, you know, uh -huh. what, what you're asking for. We have a data warehouse. We have uh, some transaction tables. And, and by the way, DB2 for ZOS is not the only source for the replication of Oracle. It could be DB2 for LUW as well. Um, so, so you could use either as, either as a source, but you may have stuff in your Oracle data warehouse that arrives from some other place. So it could be externally generated data, it could be data that is refined in the data warehouse going through an ETL process or something like that. That could be replicated back to um, the source, uh, if you want, um, to, to, a, to a DB2. Um, I don't know, the question I don't know the answer to is whether pure bi-directional replication, there is a form of replication called uh, um, bi-directional replication that comes with contact uh, pardon me, conflict detection and, and resolution. I don't know if that would be available. I'd have to take that offline and research it. But I could have two sets of unidirectional subscriptions. I could have right. one set from DB2 to Oracle and the other from Oracle to DB2 back to the same ones, and, and the data could be interchanged that way. So that, so that would work. Okay. So good question. So I am going to refer you to my second handout at this point. Uh, there is a handout called Oracle Native Q Apply. Again, I'm going to go through on the presentation, the PowerPoint, uh, a level of detail, uh, a high level of detail, and then a greater level of detail with a whole bunch of links uh, in the Oracle Native Q Apply uh, handout. So if you would go ahead to your handout that says Oracle Native Q Apply, bring up that PDF, and then have that available to you and sort of ping pong back and forth. Uh, between the presentation. I'll go over it in a high level and then you can see it in detail. Um, can I ask one other question? Um, one other quick question here. If you have, if about 25 percent of the people that are on this webinar um, are using um, the federated server approach, if they are being, um, if IBM is saying to them, and, and, and I understand, my understanding from a licensing perspective is if you own IBM Infosphere, data replication, you own CDC and Q replication. All, all true. So if you own both and, and you've got the federated server approach in there and, and you want to do something different and you're looking at different options, is it more difficult to yank out replication and put in CDC or is it more difficult to retrofit your federated server to, um, uh, to the native Q apply? 
much more difficult, I believe, to yank out um, the federated server and put CDC in okay. than to move to uh, the Oracle native Q apply. And I'm actually going to talk about a migration and coexistence okay. if you already have the federated server. So we, we will cover that in a second. Um, so the um, um, provisioning and installing the Q apply on the server. So this is uh, the Q apply that is specifically for Oracle Native. This is a different Q apply than you would use to a DB2 target. Uh, and this um, will um, we'll, we'll talk about in detail what you need to do. Um, the again, the packaging is IBM Infosphere data replication. Um, the, the version that I'm talking about right now is the almost most current version, which is 10.2.1. There is a 10.2.2, but came along too late for me to incorporate into these slides. So all of all of that, what I'm about to show you is 10.2.1. Um, the the software, uh, although you license from IBM IIDR, the software that you're actually installing is bundled with DD2 for LUW. It comes in the same packaging. There's no separate um, uh, tar file or, or zip file that contains IIDR. Um, even further complicating this is that you install not IIDR from the DB2 for LUW package, but you actually use the Infosphere Federation server installation step. And this is actually outlined in the PDF that I just referenced you to. It's also important to install FixPack 7. Uh, there is a known problem with cleaning up the done message table. I mentioned that earlier in the presentation. So fix pack 7 uh, for um, version 10.2.1. You need to create a DB2 instance. There is, however, no uh, local DB2 for LUW database necessary because you don't have to store all the metadata. The control tables are stored in the target Oracle database. And then finally, you need to install uh, and configure the Oracle call interface or the OCI software that you're probably using already to access Oracle databases. So with all of that, I'm going to go back to the PDF and it's going to actually show you the links to each of those things that I've just referred to. So the first step is to install the server using the InfoSphere's Federation uh, server install, step number one. Um, there is a link here which actually shows you what you need to do and there is a, sort of a reminder or a hint here that you use the um, double quote dot slash II setup, II for information integrator which is the old name for the Infosphere Federation server using the console input. Yes, this is my Easter egg hunt. I hear Kim, you hear Kim laughing in the background. Um, there are a lot of people on the call who may not know what an Easter egg hunt is. Um, trust me, in this context it means it's a pain in the ass. So the second step is for the fix pack 7. There is actually a tech note explaining why we need fix pack 7 and the problem that it fixes. The third step uh, is to, or step C is to do a uh, create an instance uh, for um, the, the Q apply server. Again, you're only creating the instance. You are not uh, creating a database under that instance. And then finally, connecting to the Oracle data, uh, target database. There are a series of numbered items at this link. You want to follow the numbered items for connecting to the Oracle database for the server. Now, we're going to be shifting gears here for a second, and we're going to start talking about client software. The client software, there are a series of steps. Uh, for for the ASN CLP scripting tool and for the replication center, I'm going to talk about the tools themselves in a little bit. Um, the, they both use the Oracle JDBC Type 4 driver. Um, the, you want to download from Oracle's website the OJDBC 6.jar or 7.jar. Um, for the ASN CLP, you want to verify the class path, and there, are, there is a link in the Oracle Native Q Apply PDF handout that shows you what items need to appear in that class path. There is a description of the asnservers.ini configuration file when you're using ASNCLP. ASNCLP usually uses the node and database directory when your target is a DB2 database for QApply. Obviously, you're not going to be using uh, an or, uh, a DB2 database, so you need some way to identify the Oracle database, and that is the asnservers.ini configuration file. Finally, um, 
for replication center, you need to go through the steps to add a connection uh, from the manage the, the passwords and users uh, tab on the file. <coughs> Pardon me. So back to my handout again for a second. <clears throat> You can see <clears throat> located in the PDF on the second half where it says install client, I have a letter to each of those steps, A, B, C, and D, <clears throat> and I have links to all of those that you will be able to look up and see how to uh, incorporate the specific steps um, that I have mentioned. Um, so more detailed explanation on how they go. Migration and coexistence, this is what Kim was referring to before, if I decided to um, um, actually move from the federated server uh, to the Oracle Native QApply. If at all possible, install the Oracle Native QApply local to the target Oracle database. It's pre uh, preferable for performance. If you maintain it on the intermediate server uh, where you may have federation uh, located today, uh, you still have another network hop and that can uh, slow down your latency. In the, by the way, I, I need to take this up a level for a second. The whole reason that you may be doing this, if you're using the federated server today and it's working today, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. The reason for this is um, if you are experiencing latency or throughput problems and the layers of indirection incorporated by the federation server are slowing you down and you need to move. So if you want to get the best possible performance and it is supported, um, put QApply on the same server as the Oracle database itself. I would recommend, if you're using the federated server, to install a different copy of the IIDR code for upgrade flexibility. If these are going to be coexisting on the same server, at least for some period of time, so you can do parallel testing and things like that. You can use the same intermediate server, so I can have a different copy of the IIDR code from the federated server using the Oracle native QApply. So you don't need to provision a whole new server, especially in test dev. You can do this all in the same place. <clears throat> so before I go to tooling, uh, I'd like to take a moment and give folks uh, a, uh, an opportunity to um, ask some questions. Again, if you would use the chat, um, I, I'm getting uh, a couple of questions about the presentation. The presentation will be on the Fillmore Group's uh, blog in the next day or so, along with a recording of this audio. So you'll be able to see the, um, um, the PowerPoint handouts, as well as uh, listen to the audio if you need to repeat some of this. Uh, Kim, you have a comment? Right. Well, um, also, we have contact information at the end of the presentation. So as long as you make it to the end of the slide deck with us, um, you should be able to uh, get Frank's email address. And I believe my email address is on there as well. If you have any questions, um, you're welcome to send those in. Thank you. Thank you. That's good. So I'm um, not seeing any questions beyond that. So either I'm doing a really good job or um, people are fading out. I don't know which it is. But we have a survey at the end, and you'll be able to tell me which that was. So we're going to go ahead and move forward, uh, and, and I know that there is a lot of material here and it might be overwhelming, um, but I want to make sure that uh, you have a, uh, an opportunity to ask some questions. Um, we have three topics left, but they're all smaller topics, so they won't take as much time. I know we're, uh, we probably have about 10 minutes left, so let me try to run through these. 11, actually. 11, 11 minutes, that's good, so I will make good use of all that time. So the next topic is tooling. Um, none of this should come as any surprise. None of the, the, the next set of slides should come as a surprise. Somebody who's currently using QReplication. All of these products, uh, the Replication Center, ASNCLP, QReplication Dashboard, and the Replication Alert Monitor, otherwise known as ASNMon, you should be uh, hopefully familiar with, know that they exist, and probably use them on a regular basis. The Replication Center is a... Java-based GUI, um, I believe it first came out in uh, DB2 for LUW version 5 on the client software. So we're talking at least a decade and a half ago, long, long time ago. Uh, has been around for a while. Um, and this is installed currently um, via the IBM Data Server Client. This is downloadable for free from IBM. The difference is there used to be 
a lot of other Java-based GUI clients that IBM supplied in the data server client that have gone away in version 10. They have been deprecated and discontinued. So things like the control center, um, the journal, the task center, if you ever remember those, all of those products are no longer supported. Um, those, those components are no longer supported. They weren't really products because you didn't have to pay for them. Um, those functions have been taken over by IBM's Data Studio, which is free for download, and their Optum products, which are for fee. Uh, so, for example, the Optum Performance Manager. Data Studio, again, if you're using DB2 for LUW or even DB2 for ZOS databases, you can use Data Studio today. So I just wanted to position that, that there is a dwindling set of these Java-based GUI clients. Um, the Replication Center is useful for initial proof of concepts and for inexperienced users. It is not intended, in my humble opinion, for a production build-out of dozens, hundreds, or thousands of subscriptions. If you've ever tried to build a subscription using the Replication Center, it's a fine tool, but it's a point-and-shoot interface. And the problem that you have is that you may have to do that again in your QA environment, and you may have to do that again in your production environment. And the likelihood that for dozens or hundreds or thousands of subscriptions, you're going to get that right going through a point-and-shoot is just not going to happen. So the recommended application that I would give you for those types of build-outs is the ASN CLP, the Command Line Processor. There is a program reference for replication and event publishing. The most current is available for download from the web. Again, for free, you can search on either the title or the SC19-3639. You'll be able to find this on, online and download it. Hundreds of pages. Lots of examples, a very functionally rich scripting language used to um, create and manage control tables, QMAPs, and subscriptions throughout your environment. I like to think of this as, the, I like to think of ASN CLP as the DDL or the data definition language of Q replication. The ASN CLP can be invoked uh, through the ASN CLP command line either on the Q replication client where the client software has been installed, or on the server. This is much more beneficial for an environment where you are moving from test to QA to prod. You can make um, 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 find replace um, mass uh, changes for, let's say, different Q manager names that are in prod versus QA, and for different subscription names if you change those. But you can, you can have a much more rigorous code management uh, change control process for ASN CLP than you can for the Replication Center. Um, the Q Replication uh, creation scripts can be generated once for many tables using SQL, and I'm going to give you an example of that. You can also use the promote command to extract ASN CLP from an existing topology. So if you lose your ASN CLP, I recommend using a case tool for code management the same way you would for your DDL for your table creates. But if you lose that, you can actually use the promote command that will generate ASN CLP that you can use in other environments. So for example, if you created an environment using the replication center, you can use the promote command documented in the manual that I showed you earlier for um, uh, building out uh, the ASN CLP for your QA and production environments. So going back to our third handout, the ASN CLP create QSub, let's go ahead and bring that one up. Um, let's say I have an environment where any table um, that has a creator of prod and that has the beginning characters of trade are going to be subject to replication. What I have done is created a series of SQL select statements that are union together to actually generate from the, um, the DB2 catalog tables, uh, DB2 for ZOS in this case, this can be adapted to uh, DB2 for LUW, but if I can identify the set of tables, and there may be dozens, hundreds, or thousands, based on characteristics like name and creator whether data capture changes is turned on, uh, et cetera, I can actually generate the, um, the ASN CLP scripting. And you'll be able to see this down at the bottom. The result from what I have just run in my select statements 
and there are, I believe, five of them union together, is something that approximates uh, the uh, create Q sub. And I would have as many uh, create Q sub um, uh, statements that you see there as there are tables that meet the criteria in the system catalog tables. So this is a quick and easy way uh, to generate lots of Q sub uh, subscriptions without having to hand tool each one. Very important to understand that the options that I'm specifying here are ones that you're going to have to adapt to your particular environment. So the option statement where it says all change rows, has load phase, suppress deletes, all of those may need to change. So it's going to be incumbent upon you as to whether or not uh, your particular subscriptions, if you're using this, um, meet the criteria. You're going to have to adapt these for the characteristics of the replication that you're doing. But again, this is a template that you could use to very quickly generate a whole bunch of ASN CLP scripts. This is something that was originated by uh, my colleague Ray Hull many years ago, used in a lot of different environments, and is a very uh, fast and efficient way to generate lots of Q replication subscriptions quickly using ASN CLP. <clears throat> so at this point, I am going to move on with the presentation. We have two more short topics. Oh, actually, I have one more. I have two more tools, so I can't even move beyond that. Next is the Q replication dashboard. Um, number one, um, the Q replication dashboard was going to be the central point of focus for um, the um, uh, management and development of your replication environment. Not only was it used for uh, real-time monitoring using the, the, the dancing bars that go across the screen, but you would also be able to create subscriptions. You would also be able to do event monitoring like uh, latency threshold uh, that was exceeded. Um, IBM has moved away from that. Their, their statement of direction at this point is, we were going to make the Q replication dashboard the be all and end all. We're not going to do that anymore. So the Q replication, um, um, the 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 the, um, the the replication center is still a viable product and will be a client primarily used for creating subscriptions. If you're not using ASN CLP going forward, and there is a link here for finding the Q replication dashboard. Um, it's used for real time and event monitoring. It, has a, it comes with a light, lightweight web server that can be installed on individual client workstations for everybody who's working with QREP, or centrally accessible via browser. Many people can access it. Actually have customers that install multiple copies of Q Replication Dashboard because they use it for event monitoring. They don't want to have a single point of failure. It will send email if user-defined thresholds are breached. That is, if capture goes down, if uh, latency is exceeded, if queue depths are exceeded, um, you can get an email. Unfortunately, the only interface right now is email. There's no SMTP traps, uh, pardon me, no uh, S single simple network management pro protocol, SNMP traps, um, that can be integrated with uh, other system monitoring uh, systems like NetView. So that is a failing, and it's been uh, a request for enhancement for a long time, and nothing has come of that yet. Uh, it parses data from the control table. So the uh, CAPMON and APPLYMON tables are the ones where it gathers information and uh, displays those in a graphical form. The Q Replication Alert Monitor, also known as ASNMON, uh, is an event monitor for one or more topologies. Uh, typically has its own database where it stores data for historical purposes. <clears throat> the, um, the primary difference between ASNMON and the, the Q Replication Dashboard is that alerts can be scripted using ASN CLP. Why is this important? Well, as I mentioned earlier, I have customers that have multiple Q Rep Dashboard event monitor installations to be able to manage, and every time that they need to change their thresholds, they have to go in two places and do the same things over and over again. Whereas if I use the ASN CLP, I could script my thresholds for multiple topologies, change them slightly, and so it, it, if you're in a complex environment, it greatly reduces uh, the management and the uh, opportunity for failure because the only way to manage and implement um, and, and update 
your event monitors within Q Replication Dashboard is to go through the GUI and do a point and shoot. Um, but the, um, the ASN Mon, the Replication Alert Monitor, also parses data from the control tables. So, topic number four, ASN Consumer. I'm going to hit this really quickly. There is a link in the presentation that you will be able to get. Um, one of the questions that has come up over and over again uh, from customers is, can I get data into a non-relational database? Understand that QApply can invoke a, a database stored procedure as part of its um, 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 functioning. Um, so I don't only do inserts, updates, and deletes against tables. I could also invoke an Oracle or DB2 stored procedure. However, there are other database servers like Netiza where I may want to place data from a transaction processing system like DB2 for ZOS. Um, the, uh, in terms of completeness, uh, Change Data Capture has native Netiza and native Hadoop uh, replication. However, going back to the comment that I made earlier, you may not want to introduce a completely different product. Uh, the use case that we have here is a customer says, I need to get this data from DB2 for ZOS. I already have all of the infrastructure in place on ZOS for Q Capture and the MQ servers, etc. Is there an easy way that I can get this data into Netiza? And so there is a link to developer works that allows you to use a, a product template that reads from the MQQs that uses what is called event publishing and um, then um, would allow you to write to um, a, a Netiza server where it could pick up through its own internal utilities what we call mini batches every minute, every five minutes to gather data because Netiza does not function well if you're doing what I call drip feed inserts, updates, and deletes against the database. It actually slows down because that's not what it's designed to do. The ASN consumer that's available in developer works is actually being ad uh, adapted by a customer in China right now to write to Hadoop. So basically, you can use this template and adapt it to any non-relational server that you have. So what is event publishing? Event publishing is uh, queue replication where you provide queue apply. You're reading from the queue and then you're doing something with the data. This ASN consumer was actually designed for Netiza, but can be adapted for other non-relational targets like Hadoop. The last piece is pricing. So I'm going to try to wrap this up very quickly. Um, one of the problems that a lot of our customers have had with queue replication is the pricing model is the total processor value units from the source and the target. You have to license both. What we have found in practical terms, and there's actually a link for PBU pricing. I know most of the people on here are technical. They say, I don't worry about pricing. Well, here's why you have to worry about pricing, because it could get enormously expensive for a customer, wherein we have the environment. They're already replicating from DB2 for ZOS. The ZOS platform is fully licensed for queue replication. And a customer says, well, we have this Exadata server, and we need to get five DB2 for ZOS tables on a constant drip feed basis into our Oracle Exadata warehouse. And can we just capture that data that's already available from DB2? The problem is with IBM standard licensing options is that you would have to license the entire Exadata server, which may be enormous. It may have um, tons and tons of processor, processor cores, and that could make that very expensive. And customers say rightly, I want five tables. I don't want to have most of the data on here originates in Oracle or someplace else. Why am I licensing this entire server to get five tables from DB2? So, Kim so <laughs> I'm sorry. <clears throat> no, it's fine. Well, one of the things that we're hearing customers talk about is that um, a lot of their, if you're working in a data center and the majority of your data is stored on System Z in DB2 and your internal customers come to you and say, I want to have these five tables replicated. They don't want to wait a month for it. They want the stuff. They want it immediately, and they want it moved to wherever they want it. And so organizations are trying to set up what they call replication centers, and they want somebody, their internal customers, to be able to come to the replication center and identify what data, what tables they want, and where they want it to go, and they want to be able to say, yes, we can do this for you. 
unfortunately, when you do that, if every single time someone comes to you with a replication request, the first thing you have to do is go back and reprice your entire environment in terms of PVUs. You're going to spend more time worried about how much money you're paying and getting audited for software license usage than you are setting up replication. So this, the, the magic words here are special bid. Um, the two options that Frank has put on the screen, source-only pricing and mid-tier pricing, IBM has discussed having special offerings around these two options. We totally get it. We totally understand it. Special bid means you go in and you say, this is the pricing model that works for me. This is what I want to pay for it. And you work with your IBM seller um, and you try to come up with something that's reasonable. So you're welcome to contact us with questions about this. Um, and our take on it is, if you see a huge price tag come from your IBM salesperson, don't stop there. Please press and please say, look, special bid, special bid, special bid. I want something I can afford to pay for because I want to use IBM replication. So uh, I want to talk about these two models very briefly. Source-only pricing, as its name implies, is let's say I have the environment that, that Kim is talking about um, where I have, I have data, lots of data on DB2 for ZOS. I would pay once for all the data for the, the capacity of the source server, and then I could replicate to as many targets as I want. So that would be one option uh, that's, that's being discussed that would have to be special bid. The second is mid-tier pricing, which is what Kim was refer referring to in the replication center. I would set up a replication hub that my data would, would be, um, that where all my QREP uh, would reside, and that hub would be, uh, have sufficient capacity for um, Q captures and Q apply to all the sources and targets and run everything from there, and I would only have to license that hub. I wouldn't have to license the full capacity of the sources and targets which I'm replicating. There was another um, model that they sort of backed off on, which they called metered pricing, um, wherein you could only pay for the megabytes that were actually transferred. Um, and again, this would meet the criteria of I only need five tables. Why am I paying for the full capacity of the source and target? And I think they backed off on that just because it would be too hard to monitor and manage. Exactly. So, so that, that's the net of that. So we are at, at closing right now. A most important, and I'm actually going to put this in the chat, um, um, we have a using Q replication course coming up. Uh, it is a course titled CE243. It is a four-day long instructor-led hands-on class with labs. Um, it is going to start on August 23rd. That's a Tuesday. Runs from 9 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. You can either take that class in, uh, in Baltimore, in our Towson, uh, which is a suburb of Baltimore, um, IBM authorized training classroom location, or you can take a distance learning from anywhere. Um, it, it'll be instructor-led real time, so be aware of the time shift, <laughs> whatever 9 a.m. East Coast time means to you. Um, but you will get uh, the, the ability to do the hands-on lab, and we'll be using the same interface that we're using today. It is the only class of CE243 that will be offered in North America in the second half of 2016. So if you want it, uh, take it. I'm going to hand this over to Kim for wrap-up while I am typing uh, the email address that you will use to indicate your interest in this class. Yes, we're having some trouble right now getting the class listed up on the IBM website because the class hasn't run for a couple of years publicly. Um, apparently, the materials were removed from the IBM um, training system. So uh, we had lots of people on the phone yesterday. And uh, Megan Byrne, whose email address you will see in the chat, um, Megan's been working with IBM. And supposedly, the class will be available to be registered so that you can register um, sometime soon. But in the meantime, um, Send an email to Megan if you're interested in the class, particularly if you're someone that pays for training with either an EdPAC or through um, some ELA or contract that you have in place with IBM right now because uh, it, it's impossible to register online. And so Megan's going to be managing all that um, lucky lucky thing that she is. So um, mm -hmm. we're trying to get this class to run. We know there are customers out there that have not um, had the opportunity to take any formal training. Even people that have worked with replication for two or three years, we've had come and take this class and say, wow, I had no idea what I didn't know. It's a great class. Um, Frank Fillmore, who's just doing, done this presentation, will be the teacher. And um, we will, the, for the people that are attending class in Baltimore, we'll probably take you out to dinner one night too and maybe the ball game. Um, so 
what else have you got there, Frank? I think that's it. Uh, I think that's a great summary. Uh, contact information, as Kim said. We've run a little long today. We're about 10 minutes over, but I think we covered a lot of ground. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open um, the chat up again for questions. Uh, I'll stay on here as long as, as need be to get any additional questions answered. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. Um, the recording of this audio and the PowerPoint presentation materials will be up on our blog in the next day or so. So uh, please take advantage of that. I, I got a lot of questions about will I be able to get the materials, and the answer is yes. So thank you all very much today for joining us. Uh, I, I appreciate your time and your interest, and I hope that you were able to learn something. There is a survey that comes up when you exit the webinar. Uh, please um, uh, take a moment to let us know how we did, and uh, take care, everyone.